Okay, so pleasant good morning, everyone, and welcome to our important session this morning, looking at the innovation ecosystem of the Caribbean and how we can strengthen uh, that innovation ecosystem, particularly looking this morning at Jamaica's performance on the Global Innovation Index 2020 and looking at some of the opportunities for uh, growth uh, in innovation in Jamaica and the region. Uh, I'm Marcus Scoff, Deputy Director of Legal Counsel at the Jamaica Intellectual Property Office, and I will be the moderator for this morning session. Um, I want to, of course, recognize our partners, our co-hosts in this important webinar this morning. Uh, we have the World Intellectual Property Organization, WIPO, and the Inter-American Development Bank, the IDB, were also partnering with us to present this webinar this morning. I want to thank you all for joining us uh, this morning. Um, we are going to make a start. Sorry for the slight uh, departure from the start time. We're going to go right into the program this morning. Uh, so what we'll do is have a brief opening ceremony, and then we'll go into some more of the context uh, of the discussions. And of course, we're looking forward to the full participation of you, our guests, and our um, audience who we recognize uh, is here with us from near and far. Right? We want to recognize all of the representatives of, of ministries, departments, and agencies here from the government of Jamaica, as well as from CARICOM, from our regional partners, uh, in the IP offices around the region, uh, from the OECS as well, from the Bureau of Standards Organizations as well in the region. We look forward to your full participation and we welcome you and thank you for joining us. Okay, I'm gonna call upon Ms. Lily Claire Bellamy, our Executive Director here at JIPO, uh, to bring opening remarks uh, to us this morning. Ms. Bellamy? I'm mute. Thank you so much, Marcos. And good morning, everybody from bright and sunny Jamaica. It's my great pleasure this morning to bring opening remarks at this very important session on strengthening the innovation ecosystem of the Caribbean. Marcos did the acknowledgments earlier, but I would like to recognize um, the Assistant Director General of the World Intellectual Property Organization, a friend of Jamaica, Marco Alamon. Um, who was also with us yesterday, and we look forward to his intervention later in the day. I'd also like to acknowledge the presence from the Regional Bureau of WIPO of um, Beatrice Amarin and also Carol Simpson. Um, strengthening the innovation ecosystem of the Caribbean is something that is quite important to us in Jamaica and also to the entire region. The focus of the session today will include, but not be limited to the importance of the collection of innovation data, how to improve data collection and why the measuring of innovation is important. Um, and it's also a way to focus, which is something that all of us need in the region. And I speak especially to my fellow heads of intellectual property offices to suggest ways that we can improve the measuring of innovation and how this is important to tie in the intellectual property framework with the GDP of our respective economies. Um, I want to just ask persons to pass their minds back to the revised treaty of Shagaramas, in particular, article six of that treaty. Article six speaks to the objectives of the community. And there are quite a number of objectives of the community that are indicated and highlighted, but I'd just like to focus on three of those. They included accelerated, coordinated, and sustained economic development and, con and convergence, enhanced levels of international competitiveness, an accelerated promotion of greater understanding among the people of the region and the advancement of their social, cultural, and technological development. 
The revised Treaty of Shangri-La must came into effect quite a long time ago. And we, at that time, they recognized the importance of the innovation ecosystem and how this could work to foster the development of our region as CARICOM. So I'm happy today to acknowledge and recognize, as Marcus did in his um, welcome, the participation of quite a number of member states from the CARICOM region, including Barbados, Belize, Grenada, Trinidad and Tobago, St. Vincent and the Grenadines, the Bahamas, um, and also to acknowledge the presence of the Cayman Islands, the United Kingdom, Suriname, the USA and Canada. Quite an interesting, and, and of course, Switzerland, because I see where there are representatives from our mission in Geneva, and I'm sure there are other representatives who are present this morning. We're trying to chart a new way in our region, a way that recognizes how intellectual property intersects with all aspects of our society, but in particular, the innovation ecosystem and how this can help to propel us and push us forward to further and better development. I look forward to the presentations this morning. It, they should be quite interesting and exciting. We have a very interesting and learned panel of experts. So I would encourage you, if you have already joined, to encourage your friends and colleagues to join this session today because it will be one that is quite rewarding and worthwhile. So I'd like to thank you again and I look forward to the session today and I wish that we have great success. And I thank the IDB again and the World Intellectual Property Organization for putting this discussion together. At our seminal period, we just finished the recognition of Intellectual Property Day where we looked at intellectual property and the small and medium-sized enterprises and how taking your ideas to market is important and significant. This is another pillar in that, which we looked at in just in April. So I think we're continuing the trend and building on what was focused on, on World Intellectual Property Day. So I thank you so much, Marcus, and back to you. Okay, thanks so much, Lizzie Claire. Thank you for that. Um, the right context, right, within which we are just trying to, of course, explore these issues to see how we can integrate better and improve the performance of our sectors, you know, that are IP based. So uh, thank you very much for that. Uh, Lily Clear, Executive Director of JIPO. Um, I'm just going to call upon uh, for opening remarks, Mr. Carlos Gonzalo Rivas. He's the Division Chief of the Competitiveness, Technology and Innovation Division at the IDB. Uh, please let me welcome Mr. Gonzalo Rivas. Thank you, Marcos. Uh, I want to greet also uh, Mrs. Bellamy, the Executive Director of uh, JIPO, and uh, Mr. Aleman uh, from WIPO, uh, our partners in this, and to all of you. Uh, I'm really very happy to, to be with you today because this is so important. We know that in the, the past decade, uh, the Caribbean countries, the Caribbean region has experienced uh, quite low levels of economic growth. And, and this has been exacerbated by the pandemic. So in part, this low growth is, 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 uh, uh, can be attributed to declining productivity and productivity we know that is quite linked to the question of innovation. So we need innovation. Innovation is key in order to foster productivity, growth, and prosperity for all. But innovation is also important today because we know that we are in, 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 in an era in which uh, there is so much technology, technological transformation. We are in the middle of a revolution in that sense. And the pandemic has just increased uh, the, 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 the velocity of this change, particularly in the digital economy. But we also know that our countries face another challenge, which is the question of climate change. And most of the Caribbean countries are very vulnerable. So it's very difficult to conceive a world in which we can uh, prosper, we can uh, generate social inclusion, and we can tackle the problem of climate change and, and, and environmental sustainability without innovation. 
So innovation is really key. And I'm very glad that now uh, you can see in all the Caribbean region and also in the rest of Latin America, greater concerns uh, about the, the question of how to foster innovation in our countries. And we are very happy uh, to, to be with you, accompanying you in, 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 as countries in, in this endeavor. Uh, because the question of fostering innovation is not easy. And we need to finance uh, both uh, finance from the public sector and we need to finance uh, the uh, private sector uh, in order to, uh, to, to uh, really generate the, the, uh, an ecosystem that allows uh, the creativity of the people, the creativity of the enterprises uh, to uh, you know, provide the solutions that they can. So uh, uh, for IDV, it is very important to partner with all the governments, and particularly we are very proud to partner today with the government of Jamaica uh, and the Development Bank of Jamaica in a program that is aiming exactly to do that. A, the, there is a program now in place in Jamaica, which is boosting innovation, growth, and entrepreneurship ecosystem uh, that is financed through a loan uh, from IDV to the Jamaica government. And what we want to accomplish with this uh, loan, with this program, is basically uh, try to uh, strengthen the capacities uh, of the uh, innovation and entrepreneurship ecosystem of, uh, of Jamaica. So we are working in all the uh, uh, stage of uh, the life cycle of uh, the enterprises, uh, 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 the enterprises that uh, start from uh, the idea, uh, when they come up as a startup, when, uh, when they want to grow, and, 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 and finally, how to diffuse all the technologies that uh, they can create for the rest of the companies in the in the region, so uh, uh, we are encouraging the use, also uh, uh, and the adoption of new technologies, including emerging technologies as, such as uh, artificial intelligence, big data, Internet of Things, uh, and and in general how to apply these new technologies to different productive processes and services. So we think that through this, through innovation, through entrepreneurship, we can help. Uh, to solve problems in critical areas, such as climate change, uh, uh, gender inclusion, uh, promoting diversity, diversity uh, and creating uh, productive jobs. So that's the aim. And we are also working with JIPO uh, through a technical cooperation, and uh, we, we, we are supporting, uh, strengthening the intellectual property ecosystem to increase innovation, competitiveness, and growth in Jamaica. So we are working with the government, we are working with the Development Bank of Jamaica, and we are working with JIPO in, in this endeavor of uh, making innovation a key component of uh, Jamaica growth. And we are also working with other countries in, 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 in the Caribbean region. We are very proud of what we are doing with Bahamas in, in the question of how to foster a blue economy. Blue economy offers a number of opportunities uh, for the region. Uh, the, the, the ocean is there for the Caribbean region and it's really in, an important asset. And we need to use science, technology, and innovation to obviously uh, take advantage of those uh, possibilities. And uh, we are also very, very proud of uh, working together with the WIPO uh, uh, in this uh, because uh, the Global Innovation Index is, is a very important tool. Uh, we are, have organized other webinars uh, in order to present the results of uh, this index. We consider this index uh, the most serious uh, index that is produced in, in, in the world about the, the, the question of uh, innovation. And we are really <clears throat> happy to, to see that uh, Jamaica particularly has been performing above expectation in terms of uh, its level of, uh, of innovation in comparison with uh, uh, other countries uh, of a similar level of development, but also considering well, how Jamaica was performing some years ago. So that shows that there is a path, there is a possibility to, to, to improve, and this should be something that uh, 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 can be seen uh, if you want as, as a, an example for other countries to follow. So, 
very, very happy to, to be here today. I think that this is a very, very important meeting. And I hope that this meeting will lead uh, our region to improve uh, our capabilities of for collecting data on, uh, on innovation because me measuring is very, very important. Uh, and, uh, and just uh, we look forward to working, continue working with WIPO, with JIPO, and with the government of Jamaica in this. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much, sir. Thank you very much uh, for that very um, passionate uh, remarks. We appreciate the sentiments and uh, look forward also, of course, to continuing to work with the IDB on these um, several interesting and, and innovative initiatives that we have. Um, so thanks again for your support, IDB. Uh, okay, I'm going to now introduce Mr. Marco Aleman uh, to bring remarks. Mr. Aleman is the Assistant Director General for the IP Innovation <coughs> ecosystem uh, sector at the World Intellectual Property Organization, WIPO, of course, our longstanding partners in this IP journey. We're very pleased again to have uh, WIPO, who of course produce the GII every year uh, with us to help explain and share the GII 2020. Thank you very much, Mr. Aleman. The floor is yours. Marcus, many, many thanks. And, and thanks for this um, invitation. Allow me to express our gratitude to the authorities um, of uh, Jamaica uh, for this very kind invitation uh, to this regional seminar and to the authorities of all the countries from the region participating here. So Mrs. Lily Claire Bellamy, Executive Director, Jamaica Intellectual Property Office, glad to be here with you in, in this joint activity and as usual, uh, well done. Um, and, um, and congratulations for the work conducted in the area of IP and innovation. Mr. Carlos Gonzalo Rivas, Division Chief of the Competitiveness, Technology and Innovation Division, Inter-American Development uh, Bank. Uh, we are also very proud of this uh, partnering exercise in the organization of these activities in, in the region with you and looking forward for many uh, of those um, occasions to join efforts uh, for the benefit of the member states in uh, the region. Uh, to some of the agencies participated in the panel, Mr. Harold Davis, Deputy CEO, Jamaica Business Development Corporation, Mr. Cliff um, Relay, uh, Chief Operating Officer, Latin American and Caribbean uh, New Leaf, Canada, Professor Honorable Errol Morrison, scientist, biochemist, and physician, representative of regional organizations, in particular, uh, strong appreciation to CARICOM, the organization of Eastern Caribbean states, Caribbean Export Development Agency, and the different national agencies uh, involved. The representative of the different Caribbean IP offices and authorities participated in the meeting. And finally, my WIPO colleagues, both Carol and um, Lorena, uh, that uh, have been the main driver from our side for this to happen. And of course, Sasha, that you know very well, not only lead uh, the, the important world of the organization in terms of the Global Innovation Index, but have been very much involved in the organization of this activity. Allow me to say a few words and before passing the floor to those that are going to discuss the substance of the meeting of today. I did mention recently um, uh, that something that uh, struck uh, wipers attention uh, have been um, the, the way in the last decade global economy uh, have been struggling to sustain um, higher economic growth. And, and in that regard, uh, despite those difficulties, difficulties the world have unseen level of innovation and creativity that have been unprecedented. And the role IP play without any doubt on that is very important. Not only in traditional innovation activities with technology plays a very important role or in market related activities with patent, uh, trademark, uh, design and other play a very important role, but also in the important component 
of creativity. And we know uh, how creativity uh, have been playing a, a role in the place some of the Caribbean countries uh, are getting in the Global Innovation Index. And this is important because sometimes since the Global Innovation Index refers to innovation, a lot of people may think creativity is not there. And creativity certain, certainly is one of those indicators carefully considered in giving the different, the different rankings. But who drives innovation? Uh, and who is driving this unseen level of innovation and creativity? Well, few actors are key. Uh, let's start with the firms and private actors. We, in the Global Innovation Index report, it refers to 2,500 bid firms worldwide driving innovation from the private sector perspective. Those 5,000, those 2,500 companies had spent more than 900 billion euros in research and development. So, well, this effort is the one leading innovation and creativity worldwide from the private sector perspective. What happened is in developed countries, in high income countries, 75% of the research and development expenditure come from these private efforts and the other 25 for, from public research. When it comes to developing countries, uh, uh, middle income economies and low income economies, then this is inverted. 75% of the research and development expenditure comes from public efforts and only 25 from private effort. It means those that has at hand the responsibility of policy development when it comes to innovation has also the responsibility of what to do with funds that are public funds in a 75%. And that's why all the attention you give to innovation make all the sense. First, how we promote more private sector driven innovation. Second, how we better use public funds um, efforts in, in innovation and promotion of creativity. And those are the elements that uh, are considered among all, among, among many other policy consideration and all those elements uh, and all those discussions are triggered among others by the uh, policy attention that the Global uh, Innovation Index is able to channelize at the world, uh, worldwide scale. In this context, the Global Innovation Index have been impactful on three main areas. First, for policymaker in this exercise of policy consideration. Secondly, for innovator actors in order to take informed decisions and to see how they go, the, the jurisdiction where they are, plays, uh, are uh, playing in terms of innovation. And finally, in order to promote the collection of data and in improving innovation metrics. And these three are very key important elements of the conversation you will start uh, now in a few minutes and you are going to, in the, to undertake during the exercise that you are going uh, to do in these uh, um, hours of work. Latin America in general, and the Caribbean in particular, Jamaica and Trinidad and Tobago in, 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 in a very particular way, are increasingly active with WIPO in the discussion of these, these matters. The GEI, has underlined the strong and often untaped innovation potential in Latin America and the Caribbean. The region continues to be a significant imbalance across countries, and that is a reality. And what we can do to improve the situation is without any doubt, extremely important. More work lies ahead of us. Indeed, for more than a decade, the GI has underlined the strong and often potential of Latin America. The region, as I mentioned before,
continue to show those imbalances. But at the same time, at the same time, many important work have been done in other countries. Let's take the example of Jamaica, our host, which is in a very good path. Let me highlight two elements about Jamaica. First, Jamaica runs 72 in the GI 2020, and as such, is the leader in the Caribbean in terms of innovation ranking. Second, Jamaica is also the only Caribbean country that outperforms on innovation relative to its level of development as measured in the GEI. So the strong creative sector of Jamaica and the strong performance in other areas, as I mentioned in all the meetings we have in this regard, in terms of, uh, for example, institutions, um, in terms of trademark and other has in do that has without doubt play a very important role in the place uh, Jamaica is is taking. But the organization and WIPO as a whole, but the uh, IP and innovation ecosystem sector in particular, jointly with the Latin American and Caribbean uh, division, are committed to work in the region in issues related to IP and innovation but also in all the areas that are relevant in order to improve the situation in the region. Some of this work is already on the way. Let me just mention a few. With universities and research institutions, the establishment of the first technology innovation support center, the so-called TISC at the University of West Indies, um, Mona campus in Jamaica, and the second to be launched in Trinidad, um, and Tobago, which have been delayed a little bit, but we are confident is going to happen at certain point. A special training on IP, commercialization, and technology transfer was started in 2020 with administrators, research, and lectures of institutions from Barbados, Jamaica, and Trinidad and Tobago. IP and Expo project get it to producer of Eastern Caribbean, Eastern Caribbean countries. And another example, later this year, we will organize a forum centered on innovation and leverage, leverage IP in the blue economy space with CARI Forum, as mentioned by Carlos Gonzalo before, with the participation of the Inter-American Development Bank. These are just few areas of work with our regional and international panel that I wish to highlight, but there are many others uh, that you are probably more aware than I. Concluding, I hope this meeting will significantly contribute to the further solidification and improving of the IP and innovation system across the region. WIPO, and in particular the IP and the innovation ecosystem sector and the Latin American and the Caribbean uh, division look forward to working together with the region and with the Inter-American Development Bank on this important project that I mentioned before and others that are going to be identified. I wish you a very successful meeting um, during this uh, exercise. All the best. Thank you very much, Marco. Thank you very much for that. Again, um, you know, we know the extent of work that WIPO is doing in the region and uh, certainly you know, we continue to work closely with WIPO, uh, with you and your team, and of course with with Miss uh, Miss Carol Simpson on the Caribbean section. Uh, so thanks very much for WIPO's ongoing support, and we look forward to those activities as well. You know, as we seek to strengthen the ecosystem with our partners. Um, okay, so we are a little behind time. I'm going to just go right into our next uh, speaker, then, right, um, and. What we're going to look at now are some of the key areas that uh, feature in the Global Innovation Index 2020 in terms of focusing on the identifiers that are collected, the data and the metrics, the importance of collecting data, and of course, what the data shows in terms of the innovative capacity um, of Jamaica and other countries. Uh, so we're now going to hear from Ms. Lorena Rivera-Leon, she's a program officer in the composite indicator research section in the IP and innovation ecosystem sector at WIPO. 
who will share details and give a presentation on the Global Innovation Index. Uh, please, Ms. Leon, the floor is yours. Thanks a lot, Marcus. Uh, hello, everyone. Can you can you hear me properly? Yes, yes, we can hear you. Um, can you see my screen as well? Not yet. Okay, let me figure that out. Okay. What about there? Yes, we can see it now. Yes. Okay. Okay. Uh, thanks uh, to begin with for the invitation to present the results of the Global Innovation Index uh, 2020 for on a focus on the Caribbean um, countries. So I'm not going to take too much time in things that have been discussed already by the, in the introductory remarks, but I think it's important here to mention why we're doing this at WIPO, why are we doing the index? And I think the main message from, from this slide is that we wanted why put the, that the Global Innovation Index is a policy making tool. So of course, um, a lot of economies show great interest in the rankings and in the headlines, but I think the, what we like to, um, to underline each time is the power that this, uh, all of this data basically has for policy making. So we want um, that, that the index is used for, for policymaking purposes and for taking informed decisions um, around the world. And of course, one of the main collaterals has been this uh, impetus for economies to prioritize the collection of innovation data. Um, one of the main premises of the GII is really having this holistic view of innovation. And what I mean by this, so we recognize that innovation is a complex process and that um, it cannot be only a technocentric uh, approach of measurement. And I think if anything, the global pandemic this year has really highlighted uh, the complexity around the innovation process. And what you see here on the slide is really this, um, how we try to measure this within our innovation framework. So on the left hand side, you have all the inputs to innovation. And in here we recognize that um, there are several elements that influence how uh, an economy uh, performs on innovation, but this, you know, includes also the institutions, the political environment, the regulatory, regulatory environment, and so on. Also, the availability of human capital and research, the infrastructure, the sophistication of the markets and businesses, and so on. And something we have um, seen um, in these successful uh, countries that run very well every year is their ability actually to translate um, all the innovation inputs into outputs or into results. And by this, we mean um, knowledge creation, impact and diffusion, but also more softer uh, measures of innovation, what we uh, call the creativity um, uh, subpillar, creative output subpillar, uh, that includes you know, metrics uh, on online creativity, but also on the cultural and creative services and industries overall. Um, we try to do this by obviously using uh, innovation data available and by, you know, including and comparing countries around the world. Um, so before I go into the details, I think it's important to look a little bit or to put this discussion into context, because I think we are living unprecedented times, as, uh, as Marco and, Go and Gonzalo highlighted in the beginning. And this is very much relevant for our discussion today, because I think in particular developing countries and companies or firms within developing countries are facing particular challenges. And I think, um, as Marco said, before um, we actually started drafting the, the GII 2020, we were analyzing uh, what you see uh, there on the graph that um, um, actually um, the, the the investment on R&D was really leaving a, a, a growth that was unprecedented. So not only um, innovation expenditures were growing faster than GDP, but also IP filing and activity were in uh, top records that we observed in the period 2018 and 2019. And this was reflected in venture capital data as well and other sources of, or financing, financing that were at very high levels. So one important fact here was this political determination. So really innovation 
um, was uh, has been central, as Gonzalo said, and it's, it was given a lot of um, impetus and, and prioritization, and most importantly, among uh, developing economies. But what have been observing lately? So contrary to earlier concerns, the crisis seems to have had only a small immediate impact on overall innovation standard investments and on major innovation spenders. But what we see is that uh, the crisis has really impacted the sectoral distribution of innovation. And yet uh, spending and access to finance uh, in developing countries is much more fragile and much more in danger. So these imbalances of innovation finance uh, and access are likely to be increased. So what you see here in the, in the graph is really this historical uh, R&D expenditure that has been moving parallel with GDP and has a slowing down during the economic downturn. So that's, not, um, that's no surprise in the early 90s, for example, in the early 2000s, but only in the financial crisis of 2009, what you can see there. So the main reasons for this reduced innovation expenditure at the company level are basically reduce uh, revenue and cash flow. And as a consequence, uh, investors and banks are more risk averse. And as a consequence, firms and companies face difficulties into uh, you know, getting external resources of funding and, super, and supporting their investment in their only. Um, so basically another one of the findings that we had and that we're kind of, um, uh, corroborating in this in this uh, pandemic crisis is that access to innovation finance is really concentrated in two levels. So first at country level, and here we have the usual suspects, what you see there on the graph. So countries like China, India, a lot of European countries, uh, the US um, and so on, they're the ones that are capturing most of the innovation financing. But also innovation fin financing is very much concentrated at sectoral level. And here, there's no surprise. This is the data we had up until 2018. It's concentrated in sectors such as IT software, but also um, when we look at the data up until 2020, the one that we have available now, uh, most of this concentration, once again, is in the ICT industries, but not surprisingly in the pharmaceutical industries and in software and ICT services. So there are clear winners and losers in the innovation financing landscape. Um, the same that we see is on, on BC data, and here prior to the crisis, we saw uh, a, a decrease um, in, in venture capital investments all over the world, but in particular in uh, North America uh, and Asia, and in particular China. But uh, what, we're, what we're observing now, it's um, some sort of shifts in the investments uh, that venture capitalists are doing. So they're not focusing on or rather they're focusing more in these like mega deals that are, you know, are selecting out um, a, a, a good amount of, uh, of economies of companies around the world. So this is again, creating some, um, some sort of um, stress for uh, companies in the developing economies. Now getting into the rankings, that was just to give on context and I will go a little bit faster now, just getting into the rankings, I think here, um, there's no surprise when we look at the global rankings, historically, the mayor uh, or the leaders of innovation are uh, Western economies and high income economies. I think it's well known as well, this relationship between economic development and innovation. But um, what we have seen as well is some interesting stories of economies that are uh, that have been able to, to break uh, this um, innovation um, race. And some of these, uh, we see more and more Asian economies and good examples are the Republic of Korea, but also Singapore and more and more China that are uh, tapping into, into the leading uh, race. Now let's look at where Latin America and the Caribbean is trying, trying to go a little bit more um, into the down, into the findings. So as Gonzalo and Marco uh, said, the disparities uh, uh, across the region are uh, quite obvious and probably known. So we have the usual sus uh, suspects, Mexico, Costa Rica, and Chile ranking in the top uh, 60 worldwide. And then we have a second tier, let's say, of economies that rank up until the top 60, where Jamaica is included. included. But you know, from there, um, we go all the way down to the top 110. So the disparities are uh, quite large, but interestingly, there's a lot of commonalities as well. 
So um, most of the economies in the region perform below expectations, and that I think for the level of the for the level of development. And I think this is what makes Jamaica an interesting case because it's one of the only two, together with Costa Rica, that managed to to go uh, above expectations. But also there's uh, and I will go more into the details. There's there's um, commonalities in terms of the low R and D investments, the the low use of IP of the IP systems and this kind of uh, lack of efficiency in translating innovation inputs into outputs. So let's dig a bit more. Um, so when we look at the top 10 in Latin America, we see here interesting stories emerging. So um, if you remember that, that part of the framework when we had the inputs and the outputs, uh, it's, it's interesting that many countries in the region are actually investing either less than where are, they're actually translating to outputs or vice versa. And I think one interesting case here is Jamaica that uh, invests uh, relatively, you know, the input side is, uh, is much lower than the output side. And we see um, uh, countries that are the complete opposite, like Chile that gets a lot, a lot more investments, but the outputs are, you know, below, uh, below uh, Jamaica, for example. And something interesting to highlight here is also, um, you know, Jamaica is ranked uh, third in the region in relation to outputs, much more above other um, larger economies such as Brazil or Chile or even uh, Colombia and Argentina. Um, now let's dig into the into the central into Central America and the Caribbean. And here again, there's interesting stories of a lot of disparities. So we see um, uh, economies such as Costa Rica are quite um, balanced in terms of inputs and outputs, but there's others uh, such as Trinidad and Tobago that have these disparities between you know, higher levels of performance in inputs and lower performance in outputs. So there's, um, I think overall in the region, there is this kind of imbalance in the, in the innovation uh, ecosystems. Um, and then something that mentioned, I think Gonzalo mentioned it as well, but we also discussed yesterday, is this kind of um, stagnation, as we can say, in the region. So while well, we see other, other world regions going up in the rankings and having a lot of more dynamic uh, uh, transformations, something common for the Latin American region has been this, this slow uh, decrease actually in the overall score of the ranking. And the score is the sum of all these data in the pillars once we aggregate all the indicators. And what we have seen um, over the past years is that the region is, is slowly decreasing. So, you know, this can be compensated by some countries going up and some countries going down. But I think overall, um, there is a lot of potential that hasn't, that hasn't been able to be um, um, untapped in a way. And what you see here in this, uh, in this table is exactly that. So you see that um, a lot of countries have been relatively stable, some others going up and down, some going, go, uh, going slowly up or slowly down, but no major changes. And I think one of the major changes in the past uh, couple of years is really, is really Jamaica, that in 2020 did a very, a very good um, increase. Now, this positive relationship, again, in the, uh, between innovation and development is well known. I think here I just want to highlight that uh, the case of Jamaica and Costa Rica that um, are performing our expectations. And there's only two other economies in, the, in Central America and the Caribbean that perform at their expectations for the levels of development, Salvador, El Salvador and Honduras. And all other economies that we managed to cover um, in the GII, including uh, the Dominican Republic and Trinidad and Tobago, are really performing below expectations. So what you see there in the graph is this trend line, which is you know, based on the levels of GDP uh, per capita, the expectations on what we, where we would uh, uh, look at the economies if they were uh, performing according to, to their levels of development. Um, now, when we look, uh, and here it's a little bit of um, an interesting comparison, but I just wanna also mention how uh, you know, Latin America and the Caribbean compare to these big movers. And by big movers, I mean, some of the, some of the, you know, I, I, I look around the, the economies in the, in the world, but also, you know, these Asian economies that I mentioned before, the ones that we see large increases over time, sustained increases over time. So in, in some of the key indicators, such as the number of researchers, 
the number of patents by origin, R&D expenditures, or uh, scientific productivity, we see really that despite having, in absolute terms, levels that are comparable, there is no, um, there is no, um, you know, this impulse of uh, performing much better. So there is something breaking in the ecosystem that is preventing uh, Central American and Caribbean economies to go ahead. And what I'm sharing this slide is this relationship indeed between inputs and outputs. Um, something interesting is that what I showed also before in the slides that um, the region is actually quite uh, well equipped in translating inputs into outputs. And I think this is not something we commonly see. Uh, in fact, in some of the leading economies, we see the opposite. But what you see there is, for example, Jamaica is producing is, uh, similar levels of, uh, of outputs that uh, um, with much less inputs than any other countries. So I think you know there's there's still again there's a lot of capabilities that are um, that are uh, there, but that uh, remain to be um, um, you know collectively untapped. And I think some of the key areas of these um, uh, economies that are able to perform well, so going into the top uh, right, are really focusing or are strong in um, in indicators or the pillars of education and human capital. So these indicators really make a difference. Um, now, we, we have some measures also of the quality of innovation, and by quality, we look at the, at the impact of uh, the research, at the internationalization of the, of the inventions, and also at the quality of the universities. And what we see here is that in the region, um, there's, again, a lot of disparities that are not comparable to any of these leading economies. But in particular, for Caribbean uh, economies, uh, Jamaica and Trinidad and Tobago are ranked um, uh, 49th uh, among the middle income group economies in the case of Jamaica and 49th in the high income economies in the case of Trinidad. But overall, when you look at the overall rankings, and here I'm presenting the top 10, but Caribbean economies are below the, the top 100. So there's a lot of gaps in this regard, regarding the quality uh, side. Now, just to confirm here, in terms of the human quality and research, and this is something that we discussed much more in detail yesterday, uh, there's still a lot of uh, differences in what uh, the Caribbean economies are producing relative to other Latin American countries. So there's there's an increase, increasing need to, to really think of the ecosystem as, a, as, a, as an ecosystem that is interlinked. So taking into account also all those human capital aspects and the investment in, uh, in skills, education, and research. Um, here, I think I just wanted to mention uh, some work that we're doing that is not only focused at the national level, but also in the science and technology clusters. Um, which is basically a measure of innovation based on agglomeration. And once again, here we see um, very much a world concentration that is going be beyond national borders, but you know, that is very much concentrated in the developed economies. And in Latin America, actually, there's only one cluster in Brazil, and there's, there's nothing else. So just to highlight that the worldwide, there's still a lot of, of challenges to, to, to overcome. With regards to scientific productivity, the same, and this is just to give an idea that, uh, and here we have a little bit more data for Caribbean economies of the scale of the of the productivity. And I know, you know, we we have to scale the indicators to make them comparable comparable across countries. But basically, what we're showing here is that even at in absolute values and scale values, the productivity of the region is relatively low. There's a lot of strengths, however, and I think uh, Marco signaled some of them in intangible assets, such as the production of trademarks. Here you can see that some of the economies in the, in the region are performing very well. And one good example is Jamaica, but also Panama, uh, that are in the, in the middle range, or Jamaica actually leading uh, in, the, in the top leading uh, worldwide. Similar picture in industrial designs for Jamaica and Trinidad and Tobago. So this is really a strength and an asset that would be uh, leveraged a bit more. Um, and uh, and I guess here the other important part is this um, um, importance of collecting innovation data. As we mentioned before, there's um, there's a lot of missing data and missing gaps. 
So we always question if we're actually measuring properly what is happening in the country. And we like to have this discussion with the stakeholders because in some cases, what the index is showing seems that it's not reflecting the actual uh, circumstances, but a lot of in a lot of these cases, it's really the lack of data that prevents us to do so. And I like very much, um, uh, and I'm going to get into the policy recommendations. So let's let's uh, dig a little bit into that, and I will take into the data part um, uh, into this into this uh, concluding section. But basically. Um, the reason why I started talking about the crisis uh, is because I think um, very much in line to what Gonzalo said as well. I think innovation is really central in this transition uh, period that is breaking with a lot of paradigms. So um, there's a lot of policymakers around the world that are try trying to counteract the effects of the crisis uh, on their economies through innovation. So a lot of the high and middle income economies have set up emergency relief packages to, to caution this impact of the lockdown and face the, the economic recession. However, um, uh, the challenges for developing economies are even, are even larger because I think you know, in, some, in some high income economies, even finding this balance is tricky. There's a lot of the, the, the pandemic has really brought down uh, the urgency to develop plans quickly. And this requires really a lot of policy intelligence and coordination to, to act quickly, but also to think in the long term. Um, in some cases, I was actually reading this morning about you know, leading economies that we see in the index, such as Finland, are cutting their R&D uh, investments. And this prioritization or, or you know, finding this balance between what is important in the short term and in the long term is really, is really tricky. So I think you know, developing countries will have to find intelligent ways to, to pass through these uh, challenging uh, parts in the prioritization process. Um, and I wanted to get into these links that I mentioned before between the human resource base, but also the quality and relevance of the research and how to translate this into actual results that you know, link the private and the public sector in the focus of innovation. And I think this, these linkages are, are pretty much, uh, are probably obvious in, in, you know, in, the, in the literature, but are very, very hard to manage. Uh, here, I want to just to give an example of these difficulties. And I think you know, there's a lot of emphasis that is put on the creative industries in Jamaica, but when, once we look at the data in the index, we see that uh, if we look at, the, at this pillar that we have in the creative goods and services that we measure a lot using trade data, we see that you know, when we look at the, at the trade uh, share uh, of Jamaica worldwide, we really start, see that the, that the um, sector is relatively small and you know, has not been increasing over time. So this might talk about this potential need to upgrade the, the capacities of the companies to produce products and services that meet these international standards. And this is very much going in line into finding those links between the training, the human capital, and you know, the scaling up. And for scaling up, uh, we need innovation financing. So this is just trying to give you an example of how everything is linked. And there is this uh, need to see a holistic approach to to innovation. And again, the private sector is pretty much in the center of all of this. Um, I think here we like to put emphasis that governments needs to be orchestrators of innovation. And I think this is pretty much, you know, a lot of the Schumpeterian view of having a state that really is entrepreneurial and that really helps and, and, and motivates their, their ecosystem and their, and their companies to, to innovate. Um, and then finally, I wanted to go into this point that we had a very interesting discussion yesterday with Minister Shaw of Jamaica, where we made emphasis on this, uh, of what he called his race formula. And I really like this concept because I think he put in a nutshell what we, will, we have been trying to also explain our, uh, the countries we work with, is this links between research, action, communication, and evaluation. And for evaluation, again, the only way to have to be able to execute, monitor, and uh, evaluate plans is by having this intelligence. So this monitoring should focus not only on, on plan objectives, the traditional you know, measurements of evaluation, but more into solving problems and challenges that are not only economical, economic, but are also social and environmental, what, what uh, Gonzalo was saying in his remarks. Um, 
I think I'm going a little bit over time, but I just want to finish with some of the, the examples that we see when we work with countries. So we work uh, in close relationship with countries around the world. And I think over the years, we have uh, realized that in a very simple way, there's three types of countries that use the GII in, in different ways. So first, we have a first group, which is the countries are very excited to go up and down the rankings. They're very excited the day that we launch the index and you know they, they pay attention to the highlights and that's it. Then we have a second tier that are countries that really analyze their performance in relative terms. They look at the ecosystems and look at the data and they try to understand what is behind. And uh, this group, you know, there's in very often no follow-up. But there's a third group, and this is the group that you know there's no coincidence here, are the ones that are consistently going up the ranks that have set up systematic action plans that allow them to understand not only their position worldwide, but to monitor their progress over time. So I think we have come up with this very short summary of you know, what countries do well when they go up the rankings. And I think uh, one, of the, one of the key uh, issues here is that uh, they have formulated innovation policies that, uh, that are embedded into the national development path. So innovation is central, basically, and this, uh, you know, they have recognized this holistic view that I have been mentioning across. Now, there's also there's also economies. Uh, there are also economies that have set up these tax task forces that are cross ministerial. So you know they work together, and it was very nice to see yesterday all these discussions that we were having with the Jamaican ecosystem, and it's pretty much you know this this um, idea of working together to achieve a, a, a common goal. So this is what we see um, in other successful economies as well. Then find, um, another point is this interaction uh, in the innovation ecosystem between private and, and the public sectors, but also you know, setting up uh, um, uh, consultations that includes the research, the research part. So again, setting the, the, the ecosystem properly. Then the national, IP policy is very much aligned to, the, to their innovation policy. So, you know, it's not, they're not isolated, they, they, they reach a common goal and so on. Then their policy targets are quantifiable, they're easy to evaluate, and they're revisited uh, regularly. So these are kind of the uh, success uh, economies. Now, some we have also seen unsuccessful cases, and I think here just, um, for the sake of uh, sharing is, you know, countries that set very over ambitious and unrealistic targets, countries that expect policy changes to happen, you know, uh, within the short term or immediate. And I think, you know, the tricky part about innovation is that the, the, the main results are observing the long term. There's also countries that treat the GII just as, as a statistical process, and it's something that we really discourage. And finally, um, you know, this long-term uh, view of innovation that goes between three to five years and thinking in the long-term. So I think, uh, I think that's it. I, I know there's a lot of information here, but I look forward to, um, to hear the discussions and to see if anything that we have seen in these results actually talks to, to your ecosystems and if you find it, uh, of course, uh, useful. Thanks a lot, Marcus. Thank you very much. Verena, uh, really interesting, um, you know, really good to look at the figures and to look at the facts, look at the data, you know, really enlightening and um, really useful for, for policy making, you know, I think it's really important that we get this message across that, um, you know, we can improve if we have better coordination and certainly better planning around these issues. But I'm um, only space for discussion. So thanks, Verena, and I'm going to invite uh, Ms. Kayla Grant, who is Senior Sector Associate um, at the Competitiveness, Technology and Innovation Division of the American Development Bank, um, and a friend of uh, JIPO to present now on case studies and lessons uh, as it relates to innovation and strengthening um, the ecosystem from other countries. So Kayla, over to you. Okay, great. Thank you so much, Marcus. Um, are you seeing the presentation? Just to make sure. Yes, yes, we are. Okay, because I, I, I'm not. <laughs> okay, excellent. Okay. Thank you so much. And good morning or good afternoon in some cases to everyone. Uh, Lorena did an excellent uh, presentation on the GII, and I'm sure there might be quite a few questions there. So I will make my presentation um, a bit brief. 
uh, given that we are a little bit uh, behind time. But uh, just to note, I would also be very happy to have uh, follow-up discussions after this event uh, with our team to discuss it a little bit more in depth. And also, if you have any questions, uh, we're hoping to be able to answer that uh, next week when we respond to everyone with the PowerPoint presentations and the videos and a brief summary of some of the, the findings uh, from, from this event. So I'll jump right into it. I will be um, focusing on the support, uh, particularly uh, from our experience at the IDB that we have had in supporting economies in strengthening their national uh, innovation ecosystems and some of the case studies that, um, that we have here. And to start off, I would like to um, quickly establish uh, what we mean uh, as it pertains to the terminology of innovation ecosystem. And then I will share some of these experiences um, that we've had both in Latin America and the Caribbean. So as um, all previous speakers um, have already established, innovation is absolutely critical um, to the development strategy and how we move forward. So when we're looking at the innovation ecosystem, what is that exactly? The innovation ecosystem um, consists of a number of various actors that interact together and form very complex relationships. Uh, these include universities, governments, corporations, looking at incubators, accelerators, our financiers, venture capitalists, private investors. But at the center of this, and Lorena touched on this, is the fact that we view firms or, or businesses and companies as the main protagonist of innovation. And they're embedded within this ecosystem that could either encourage their innovation or actually inhibit their innovation. And as such, this is why we place such an emphasis on understanding that innovation ecosystem and what it consists of and mapping the innovation ecosystem. And this is where data, uh, which was very much highlighted by Lorena, is absolutely critical to our understanding of the innovation ecosystem so that we can then identify the gaps or the weaknesses and develop appropriate policies or regulation and programs to address um, these, these weaknesses and gaps that we've, we've noticed. Um, and so here is a quick example that I wanted to highlight. My source here is Alejandro Delgado. So we have various projects, one in Belize, uh, which is close to home and I am from Belize, is that we are currently supporting Belize with developing an innovation roadmap which would there, um, therefore um, uh, inform the country's uh, innovation at, in, within their development strategy. And we're also developing an innovation diagnostic to understand where firms are using, of course, data that's available, and then also moving towards uh, what's called an innovation pack, which pulls from the example of Medellin in Colombia, where they have the private sector committing to what their investment to innovation activities would be. And this, again, goes to the point that was raised by uh, a, by Marco um, in, in terms of the fact that there's this flip case a, a lot of the times where it's a public sector that's doing almost 70% of the uh, investment uh, and support for innovation and, and the private sector 30%. So we want to uh, shift that a little bit. But what I really want to emphasize here, and it's a little bit hard to see, is that Alejandro uh, is looking at six main pillars for mapping the, the innovation ecosystem. This has to do with culture and mentality, talent, platforms. When we say platforms, what we're looking at here is a type of technical assistance that's being provided, the, the network, the mentorship uh, to uh, our firms, the infrastructure, such as ICT infrastructure to enable um, innovation and digital innovation at that, uh, funding from both traditional and non-traditional sources, and also knowledge in terms of how we generate, disseminate, and also absorb and diffuse uh, that particular knowledge. And all of these pillars create value within the ecosystem. And so by mapping and then assessing the innovation ecosystem and using the data that's available to then identify the gaps and market failures, we then develop policies and programs. And so I wanted to share with you some of these uh, programs that we have developed and have drawn lessons from, but also to emphasize the type of impact that these programs have had. The first that I'd want to start off with, I'm um, using these pillars to um, streamline my presentation, so I might be jumping around a bit, so excuse me for that. But starting with culture and mentality. So say for instance that 
from this uh, mapping and this assessment, we realized we really need to address the culture and mentality, especially as it pertains to risk taking and this entrepreneurship culture. Then the idea is how can we support the entrepreneurship ecosystem? And so we've had experiences, for example, with supporting the Pacific Alliance and entrepreneurship system, Peru um, as well. The one that I wanted to highlight um, here and just start off with close at home is looking at the Big E program and also the Compete Caribbean Partnership Facility. In particular, um, so Compete Caribbean, if you're familiar, they are a private sector development program. They have in their first phase supported new jobs, uh, increase in exports and revenues for the, for the firms that they've supported. And what the phase two is really focusing on is how to increase productivity and innovation in the private sector. So it's direct financing through a number of various programs. And again, this is based on looking at the ecosystem and identifying what these gaps are. Sometimes a program takes a regional approach, other times it's a national approach to resolve these problems. For example, a regional approach is looking uh, for a program to support innovation is the Technology Extension Services Program where we're working with um, various organizations in order to help with the adoption of technology uh, amongst um, MSMEs in agriculture and also manufacturing and um, uh, tourism industries. So that's the first line uh, of support that we see clusters and value chains. We support entrepreneurship and innovation ecosystems and building that. And then tandem to that is the business and innovation climate reforms in terms of how we can facilitate through policy and regulatory reforms, institutional strengthening, and also development of knowledge products and dissemination, how we can facilitate uh, building that innovation um, and business climate so that firms can innovate. So I wanted to highlight that program uh, particularly, and also uh, as it relates to Jamaica to highlight the boosting innovation, growth and entrepreneurship ecosystems in Jamaica. So we started this program as a small grant where we were supporting the Development Bank of Jamaica um, in strengthening their innovation ecosystem. So we're supporting them with studies. And this was then scaled up to a, to a major loan with, um, which shows the government of Jamaica's very strong uh, support for innovation, developing the innovation ecosystem. So what this program does, and uh, Gonzalo mentioned this, is that it looks at the life stages of the, of the firm. So the, the focus is on MSMEs and it looks at their how they're growing and where they are at different stages and what the gaps are and what are the types of specific support that they need as it relates to helping them to innovate and grow. If you're at the entrepreneurship stage, for instance, getting access to early stage capital, incubator support, entrepreneurial skills, uh, even support with technology uh, transfer. And here's where I, I'm bringing in the biggie as it pertains to culture and mentality. So how you can um, raise awareness of women entrepreneurs or young entrepreneurs and really um, show the ecosystem that risk-taking, how that there is re high reward uh, for risk-taking and that you have an ecosystem that's supporting you. And then it moves to the startup stage where we're setting up a VC and a sidecar fund uh, within Jamaica and then moving on to this other stages, um, supporting more mature firms in terms of innovation funding, uh, et cetera. So, those are two programs close to home uh, that I wanted to highlight uh, as I immediately looked at this column of culture uh, and mentality. Next that we have is, a, if there's a gap in, and Marcus, feel free to interrupt me at some point because I did not put on my timer to let me know how much time I have left. Thanks. <laughs> it's talent. And so this is where we had programs through Compete Caribbean, for instance, as, as well in other countries in Latin America on digital talent bootcamp, how we can strengthen R&D uh, initiatives, for instance, such as grants for research work, et cetera. If another gap uh, that we're looking at is in terms of the platform, this is where the IDB um, has a lot of experience in supporting the development of innovation agencies that help to coordinate the ecosystem and promote technology um, and innovation. So as you can see here, there are a number of innovation agencies that we've supported one way or the other or established. And the one that I wanted to highlight actually is ANI. Uh, this is the National Agency for Investigation um, and Innovation in Uruguay. And this is a, a, a investment over 10 years that has supported training, incubation, seed capital, R&D platforms. 
um, human capital development, et cetera. And there was an impact evaluation that was done on this particular program. Because the question, of course, is when you take this to your government that we want to put in this policy or we want to put in this program, okay, let's justify the cost and expanding our budget to be able to put into this. So interestingly, the impact evaluation for this program shows that for each dollar of support that was provided by Annie in terms of financial support has generated almost approximately $19 in additional fiscal revenues. And the fact that 20% of these firms are more likely to export innovative products and that businesses supported were three times more likely to invest in innovation. So it's, this is the reason why data is so critical and so important to our work. And I really want to emphasize and encourage that we work together to continue seeing how we can push this forward. There are several other cases that it could cover, but I'm going to jump to the end now. And this actually, in terms of you know, collecting data and how we move forward, is an area that I wanted to bring up. It was actually Malcolm through, through a sidebar email that he reached out to me to speak about this, uh, this idea of the regional innovation uh, ecosystem and how we can work together as a region on this front because we tend, we are emphasizing and working at the national level. But I'd like to pose that as a question to my audience and to get your inputs and thoughts as to how you foresee this regional innovation ecosystem working. There has been some past studies that have been done on this, um, but I find this a very interesting topic for us to continue our discussion and dialogue in the future. So thank you everyone. We will be sharing the information uh, because uh, there's a lot. A, but I just really wanted to emphasize um, that we, we have various experiences that we can draw on. We have impact evaluations and data that has been collected that shows the value and the importance of investing in innovation, how we can move forward in doing so. Thank you. Thank you very much, Kayla. Thank you for that. Um, I know you were speeding through a bit, you know, but um, very interesting. And of course, as you say, we'll make the presentations um, available, but yes. We want to make sure that everything is being connected, you know, to show how, of course, why we are trying to track these innovation patterns, you know, why we are trying to compare what we're doing here with what is happening in other regions, and you know, to kind of see how we can assess our, our relative trends and weaknesses and find some solutions for our ecosystem to improve and strengthen, right, regionally. So thanks for that, um, and I want to leave some time for discussion. So I'm going to introduce now our next speaker. So this is. A panel discussion that we're going to have right now with three of our key um, persons who are involved in innovation and in the ecosystem locally in Jamaica, uh, just to get their insights as to what are some of the challenges, which are some of the opportunities, you know, let's say strengths and weaknesses that we can look at in terms of how we can maybe position ourselves to maximize opportunities and to improve on our GII ranking. So I'm going to invite uh, Mr. Harold Davis to uh, present. Um, I'm going to ask each speaker to speak for about five to 10 minutes maximum. I mean, if it can be on the shorter side of that, that would be also good so we can have some discussion. Mr. Davis is a trained engineer, industrial engineer with over 25 years experience um, in industrial development. He specializes in creative industries, innovation, development finance, agriculture, business development, and MSME strategies. He is a specialist in MSME clustering and management incubation systems. Mr. Davis is the Deputy Chief Executive Officer of the, J the JBDC, Jamaica Business Development Corporation, where he served in that capacity since 2001. He's also worked previously uh, at the Jamaica Promotions Corporation, Productivity Center, and also at the Export Import Bank of Jamaica. Mr. Davis is also an accomplished musician, singer, songwriter, and a recording artist in his own right. So Harold, over to you, sir. Thank you so much, Marcus. And um, just before I go, kudos to Jaipo. And um, of course, the support of Waipo. It's great to see you, Carol. Um, Marcus and Lily Clear, always great to be here. And of course, the support of IDB as well. Um, it was very exciting for us to be a part of this session this morning because innovation is really the linchpin of um, any potential growth and development that our economy will have. I speak to you from the perspective of um, an entity that has been focused on MSME development from its inception and entrepreneurial development from, from its inception. And some of the 
uh, thoughts that, that I share with you this morning are really the thoughts of all emanating out of that experience and some of the thoughts of all entrepreneurs themselves. I believe, let me just state uh, fundamentally, I believe that Jamaica has the potential to be the innovation superpower of the Western hemisphere. I mean, and I believe by extension that the Caribbean region has also the potential um, to be the superpower for, the, for, for this hemisphere completely. Um, if you look at the Global Entrepreneurship Monitor, you'll see that Jamaica constantly ranks in the top five. We don't reach the top 10 in terms of being most entrepreneurial. And you know, you know that innovation is a critical ingredient in the whole entrepreneurial um, um, journey. But some of the things that we need to do to make sure that we are more involved our MSMEs in this journey is first of all, I believe, a demystification of what this innovation is really is. And some, there are some, a lot of myths that are around that, that and unfortunately um, uh, crowds the space. Innovation, innovation, for instance, is not tech per se. Tech enables in innovation and in, in, in many instances, uh, innovation creates the tech which we now use as tools to create further innovation. So it's not tech, it's not, it's not also synonymous with creativity. It's not, it's not interchangeable. Um, creativity spurs in innovation and, and it create, it creates a, a foundation for the movement um, and the growth of innovation, for instance. Um, the other thing is that sometimes we think we use the words innovation and, and, and research and development and things of that nature. And we use it in the context that it, it, it should only be explained if we have two or three degrees. We need to break it down and, and, and have persons understand that. Research is what you do on a daily basis in your business. Business development and product development also is what you do on a daily basis to make sure that you're adding value constantly to um, your, your business um, client. And sometimes we're guilty of that. Uh, the, the other myth that I want to just, uh, just mention is that innovation don't necessarily have to be disruptive. Um, as a matter of fact, a large number of innovations are not disruptive. I'm not saying at all that we don't have the potential in the region to be disruptive in our innovation. We do. And as a matter of fact, we, we are guilty of perhaps not celebrating sufficiently some of the disruptive innovations that we are, um, uh, that we are guilty of. <laughs> like for instance, the handcart, those of you in Jamaica would know that the handcart in, 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 in the market downtown is a major innovation <laughs> that, has, that, that has rocked the world. The steel pan in Trinidad, for instance, is a major disruptive innovation, again, which we don't celebrate sufficiently. But the point I wanna make, however, is that really incremental innovation is what we, 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 we ought to be focusing on in our business development strategy on a daily basis. They have this nomenclature where it says that innovate or die. Innovation really is something that we should, is a daily activity that we should be doing, we should be looking at for to moving our business um, um, forward. So innovation is about the creation of solutions, as, as we know. But um, the final two points that I want to make, and I'm sticking to the five minutes, uh, Marco. So the first thing is the demystification of, of what is in a cut. We want, if we want to move our innovation ecosystem, the first thing that we need to, is inclusion in terms of that movement and persons understanding exactly what it is and how it is that they can participate in that movement. One of the things that we need to look at, I believe, in our, and encourage in our ecosystem in Jamaica and the region is this whole concept of open innovation, um, where we have persons who are innovators, innovators and, and solution providers looking, and you have persons who are looking for solutions and you sometimes we tend to look inwards in our business for the solution rather than looking um, to, to collaborate strategically with persons who provide who can provide a solution outside of our outside of our business? That's something that we need to focus. One of the things that COVID has taught us um, in this period is that we have found that there has been a high level of collaboration amongst firms um, for services, for products, um, for innovative ideas, and so on. One of the things that we have to do if we strengthen our innovation ecosystem is to encourage this, 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 this drive of, of what we call um, open innovation. The other thing that I want to mention is that the clear role of government. No, there are several roles that the government should have in terms of innovation, but one of the key things that our government should focus on and ought to be focused on as a driver of innovation is smart government. Um, in Jamaica, we call it giant government. 
um, making sure, and, and I noticed in the, in, in the rankings as well, that's one of our low points in terms of um, the indicators of government's online service, for instance. Um, we have to make sure that we have smart government, that our solutions that we provide as government are smart, effective, and efficient in terms of the solution itself that is prov provided. Another role of government is connecting the dots and, and connecting the dots in the ecosystem is a very important um, role because here we need to be leveraging the strengths have a, as identified by the GII um, the, of, of, of the country and seeing how it is that we can coordinate strategically to make sure that the weaknesses are also dealt with. On the topic of facilitating open innovation and innovation sharing and innovation collect community, one of the things that we need to be doing to look at uh, for, for strengthening the ecosystem is facilitating physical and virtual platforms um, that can encourage businesses, creative businesses, and so on to innovate. Yes, incubators, yes, accelerators, but more than that, things like design labs, for instance, that, that you know, designers can come into a space and, 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 and look at potential solutions for um, for themselves and also for big businesses as well. We spoke about the financial products that support business innovation. Again, that we're working on that, we're getting a little better with that, and Big E has been a major help where that is concerned and work of DBJ, et cetera, has been, a, has been helped. But also, but, but there is a gap in terms of the provision of financing for research and product development in our region, I think that's, that's, that's very important. Many times when a business starts, um, there's no fact for them to really invest sufficiently in research and, and development, which remember, you don't, have, you don't need three degrees for. But we need to have funding on an ongoing basis and Big E is an excellent support for that. Um, that provides, that is focused on research funding, funding for help persons to do research and um, product development. One more critical thing that government needs to lead, and that's the whole business of appropriate data mining. And on that, I want to use the example of the creative industries as it's close to my heart and my fingers and voice and all these kind of wonderful things. We have just completed uh, the initial stages of a mapping exercise for our creative industries in Jamaica. And I note, um, the, the strength, one of the strengths of, of the, on the output side of the GII is the creative output. But the truth is that um, there is no finite empirical data on the creative industries as it relates to who is in it, the specific value to GDP, the continuous valuation of that value to, to GDP, the data mining conduits and so on, even the validation framework within our Statistical Institute of Jamaica needs some um, working on in terms of to be able to collect that information. We have concluded the first phase of the mapping exercise. We're going into the second phase now supported by UNESCO and some other um, great partners of ours. It's very important. One of the critical things that have come on the table for our um, for, for for the for the first first phase of this mapping exercise, is the fact that one yes we know we don't have any data, but also there is need to connect the dots and there is need for ownership of the industry players, the industry practitioners in 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 the process. And we're going to share that information with 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 Jaipo and and the world as we are we are now just now releasing that information. Finally. I want to say that in terms of developing the innovation culture in a country like Jamaica, and I suspect the region, we have to be very careful and specific about the titles and the names that we give to our innovators. In many instances, business startups, um, and many, many instances, we, we refer to a um, person starting a business and trying a thing as trying a thing or hustlers. To me, that hustler is the seed for an innovation that will lead to a properly developed and growing and, and beneficial business. And we need to see it as such, yeah? because at the end of the day, I believe that with the inclusion strategy 
of all our folks that are involved in the innovation process in Jamaica. That's everybody, the practitioners, the small business, the persons who have the idea, the creative, and so on, the financial institution. That is very important for us to be able to um, 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 uh, move the process forward. There are lots more that I would lo love to share, but I'll leave it there, Marcus, and um, invite the questions after. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you, Harold. Very, very sharp to the point, succinct, and your wealth of experience in this area shows. So I'm glad that we had you today. And yes, I know we're going to have some questions that you can help us to answer. Um, but yes, I'm going to introduce our next uh, panelist. So thanks very much, Harold, for opening our panel discussion. And next, I'm going to introduce Mr. Sorry, Dr. Cliff Riley, Chief Operating Officer for Latin America and the Caribbean, who is representing New Leaf Canada Inc. today. Uh, Dr. Riley uh, is a PhD in biotechnology. He has a Master of Arts in Teaching and a Bachelor of Science degree in Chemistry and Biochemistry from the University of the West Indies, Mona. Uh, Dr. Riley is Director of the Caribbean Climate Innovation Center and is also president of Curry Science and is a member of the University Council of Jamaica Science and Technology Advisory Committee. He also served previously as the executive director of the Scientific Research Council. So Dr. Riley has a wealth of knowledge and information of and years of experience. So Dr. Riley, uh, I hope you can share with us now succinctly in a few minutes your uh, views and perspectives on this issue. Thank you very much. Thanks so much, um, Marcus, and congrats to the team from JIPO and the WIPO, as well as the IDB, in terms of highlighting our new ranking and exploring avenues in which we can strengthen and improve our innovation um, um, ecosystem in Jamaica. Um, Harold hit the nail on the head um, earlier in terms of, you know, us better defining and demystifying what innovation is. There are quite a number of alternate conceptions or misconceptions within our space. and. You know, a number of persons operating in this space believe in that they have a prototype, but they have a good idea means that they are innovator. And, you know, we tend to find quite a number of prototypes. When you're looking at the Jamaican ecosystem, a number of personal prototypes, especially looking on the wellness industry, we're looking to the food sector as well, there are quite a number of value added product, products, but they really make it to market. And there are a number of deterrents in terms of some of the reasons why these products really make to market. And those are some of the things that I believe that we really need to seek to address as a country. Um, first and foremost, I must highlight we're a very, very strong IP system in Jamaica, a very strong intellectual property um, system in Jamaica. Um, Lily Claire and her team has been a fantastic job. Um, Persons have been thoroughly briefed on the different types of protections. The cost is low, the turnaround time is relatively um, are relatively fast. So we have covered that era, but it's moving these prototypes to the market that makes it very, very difficult. And we have to find a way to get that done. How do we move from all these prototypes? How do we move our entry-level entrepreneurs from our incubators and our accelerators to the actual market space? Because that is where you're gonna have a significant increase in terms of the output from innovation. One of the areas that I think will play a major role there is in terms of facilitating, developing, implementing a formal innovation management and supportive system. And with the, the wealth of knowledge and expertise we have within the Jamaican space, as well as the breadth of our partnerships, we should be able as government and private to see how we're we gonna frame our innovation management system to support our entrepreneurs. Because we're not short on ideas we have one of the most creative population, and I mean regionally, we the Caribbean in, in the world. Harold spoke about our, our hand cards. We are seeing motorized hand cards just flying past us on the roads now. Our bicycles are now becoming motorized. I was quite intrigued when I went to train that uh, about a couple of years ago and realized that they had these packets, these packs you could purchase, attach it to your bicycles and they're, all, they're now motorized. You know, so we are very, very creative. How do we facilitate? How do we support and harness that creativity and bring persons into the mainstream innovation space? One of the things I've been seeing in Jamaica over the past years is a flurry of investment in R&D. And you're seeing quite a bit in the wellness-related industries, you know, and a lot of it is driven by the endemic plants within Jamaica, the medicinal benefits of our plants in Jamaica, and I know Prof. Morrison may touch on some of those in, uh, in terms of interest in that space, 
but then the supportive framework is not really there to move those products from the prototypes to the international market space. And, and we have seen so many of our um, entrepreneurs um, and so many of the R&D entities having their products manufactured overseas, having them registered overseas, and then imported into Jamaica with Jamaican inputs, because they tend to find that a supportive and regular framework to have your products developed as well as registered in the US is far easier than in the Jamaican space. So we have to look on a regulator framework and ensure that the frameworks that we have are supportive and not there to restrict innovation. Because well, you know, during my years at the SRC, we have seen so many companies, excellent nutraceutical awareness product ideas. When you, when you actually look at the cost that they have to incur to get those products registered, for sale in the market space or for export, that's that's pretty much like a, a, a factor that is driving, that has driven quite a bit of persons out of the, the innovative space. So, so there need to be that level of support from our regulatory institutions. I think we, we have come to a point where our regulatory institutions should be supportive and not restrictive. And I think they are too restrictive. And, and, and I don't want to throw stones at the Ministry of Health, but it's one of the entities that we can have to look into. And the reason why I'm saying that is that the largest innovations we see, the most innovations we see in Jamaica are either food-based or wellness-based. And we are known for our food. It's not food ourselves, we are known for our food. We are known for our natural remedies. In the same way we are known for reggae and we are known for our creative industries. We have to harness those and see our best to get things flowing. So the supportive framework from our, from our regulatory bodies, our oversight bodies is really, really important. And because we have private sector investing heavily in R&D, it's not just a lack of funding from government anymore than many private sector institutions pumping in significant amount of funds in the, in the institutions, but it is some, there are some delays in moving forward with the regulatory frameworks that exist within our spaces as well. Another area that we kind of have to look into, um, Harold into that is earlier, we need to see how we can men address that trust issue, address that trust factor. And, and this is why. A number of our micro and small enterprises have brilliant ideas, but they are fearful that persons will move their ideas or move ahead faster than they are able to if they partner with larger institutions. So we have to find a way to bridge that gap with the micro and small enterprises. And hey, guess what? If we have you working closely with the Karen Martin University's Innovation Unit in Engineering, it is a partnership. Nobody's moving away with, your, with your, your, your data or with your product. If you're working with the JBDC or the Stanford Research Council, these institutions are there to support you. They, are, they have no interest in taking your product and moving to someone else. So trust remains one of the issues. And because of that lack of trust, you find a number of migrant small enterprises trying to do everything on their own. They won't have um, approach the venture capitalists don't want to affect, approach entities for any financing because they are so fearful. So at some point, as we demystify what innovation is, we just say we can address that trust um, issue. And we have to look also on a third tier in terms of supportive systems, frameworks, and institutions that will allow for the manufacturing. You have a, a wider array of products. So I look at SRC, we're developing like about 70 to 80 new products every year, but only two of those products made it to the market space. So persons sat on those products because they couldn't find entities to co-manufacture. When you look on the wellness space, it's even worse. Our local pharmaceutical companies, they find it difficult to manufacture for micro and small enterprises. So they have very good innovations, but these products can't be manufactured. So they can't be exported. They can't drive our impact positive on the economy. And that is one of the driving forces where so many Jamaicans go overseas manufacture their products, register them, then import and sell them back in the Jamaican market space. So we have to look in terms of those supportive frameworks, how do we support the co-packaging, have our pharmaceutical, nutraceutical, larger companies with resources to better assist American small enterprises who have good ideas and very good products and have a very drive to, to play a major innovation system to support they getting their products onto the market space. I'm talking about high quality, um, effective products to the market space. So trust is really important. The support from private sector and co-packaging, the support from government in terms of the, the supportive regulatory framework, not just 
the framework to just shut down companies that don't comply, but to support institutions to get them to a level that they can um, reach the requirements and the standards that are established will, will take us a very, very far way in, in driving and supporting innovation. And lastly, the year I want to mention is that we have a big misconception with research in Jamaica. We treat research broadly. We are, we are not placing enough emphasis on research for development. So a lot of our research is based on writing a new paper, getting promoted in our universities, getting some recognition, but we're not doing the applied type of research that leads to development. And we need to place a bit more focus on that, a bit more focus on the clinical research that will move our moringa, move our um, 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 salsa perla to a format, to a product that can perform effectively in the market space. These are the high, high throughput innovations we're looking at. Not just a capsule or a tea bag, but a product that can compete effectively in the global market space. And this is where the level of applied research really comes in. So again, in that, that national innovation supportive system is the kind of support for R&B to validate and confirm these products so they can stand the test of time in the international market space. So it is quite important we have those discussions, those partnerships with key stakeholders and get the ball rolling because we've been discussing innovation in Jamaica for a very long time now. I'm happy to see that we are moving nice along in the Global Innovation Index. But if we're able to put, connect the dots, we'll be moving much faster and we'll be impacting even greater, more lives, even much more throughout the, um, not just Jamaica, but throughout the region. I'll, I'll keep it there for now and until we have a discussion. Okay, all right. Thank you very much, um, Vlad Cliff. Nice and to the point as well. Of course, wealth of experience sh sharing with us. So thanks for that. Um, okay, I'm going to uh, invite then Professor Errol Morrison to also share his insights with us. Uh, Professor Donorable Errol Morrison is former Director General of the National Commission on Science and Technology. As a biochemist, he's done extensive research on indigenous medicinal plants as a potential therapeutic agent in diabetes and hypertension. He specializes in endocrinology and metabolic diseases and he's done widespread studies on diabetes in the region. He's also a former president of the University of Technology Jamaica. He's written over 200 peer-reviewed scientific publications, 20 books and other technical reports. He is, of course, one of Jamaica's most distinguished scientists, Professor Donald Errol Morrison. Prof. Morrison. Thank you. Thank you, Marcus. Uh, it's good to be with you. As you might notice, I'm actually in my diabetes clinic. This is my kind of retirement. But I have, I have you know, heard Harold and Cliff, and they have really, you know, uh, discuss the Jamaican perspective uh, in depth and in breadth. But I have three brief comments that I want to make. And from the main speakers, I was really uh, pleased. I've been following it as well um, over my eight years in government with the National Commission on Science and Technology. That global index that we, uh, global innovation index, that Jamaica has been featuring in quite favorably. I just wanted to point out that much of the information that is being gleaned is really out of the government sector. We're not getting adequate information out of the private sector, nor from academia. So what I am considering, if we were really to bring those on board, maybe we would even look a cut above the rest. So I would think that what we need to do, and this is one of the activities that the NCST has been trying to undertake, reaching out to the private sector to understand what is happening in their landscape. And the, the, the educational institutions just seem to you know, play poker with their information. So I don't know where that is going, but if we were able to bring that into the total consideration, I would think that Jamaica would look even better than we are doing there now. The other matter that has been on my mind for some time, and I brought it up in that earlier discussion with the WIPO uh, webinar, 
And that is a matter of the fact that many, not many, most of our innovators and startups, you know, suffer from the financial support. And you've heard that from everybody. So let me just get to the point by saying, look, despite the fact that the government, I think, had passed a law that these intellectual properties could be used as collateral. And we now have the securities interest in personal, you know, uh, property, intellectual property. Um, we are still not seeing that recognition being given to the intellectual property, the new ideas, the patents, the trademarks, you know, the utility models, etc. And what I learned recently is that we do have a few valuators who could look at these patents or trademarks, et cetera, and give some you know, value. But I still think there's a strong skepticism in the financial world. And I am thinking and proposing, if it is not already in the discussion scenario, that this is where WIPO could be of value to JIPO and the local situation in Jamaica. Because if WIPO were to be able to have some workshops that could further endorse the credibility of our local valuators, that may give even a little greater comfort zone to our financial institutions to really begin to use you know, these trademarks, et cetera, as collateral. And I think it is very important that we do so because you've heard, and it's a real thing, most of our you know, innovators, our new thinkers, or those who want to implement are strapped for cash support. So we need to be able to value you know, that intellectual aspect. And as I say that, the last point I wanted to just you know, discuss is the fact that by far, the contributions of innovation, and I've been working with this since 2012, Every two years, we make a national call for individuals to bring in their, their, their uh, new thinking, new ideas, new inventions, et cetera, you know, for assessment at a national level. And 70% of those who come in are from non-institutions, what you would call the man in the street, the man seeing a problem at his workplace or in his environment and coming up with an idea you know, to, to, to support it. But what he is being hamstrung by in addition is not only a lack of funding, but a lack of ability to write up convincingly to con so that sponsors, venture capitalists can be assured that here is a good product, it's well presented, et cetera, and they would want to put their money behind that. And what I think, I know Jaipo, puts together the odd workshop. But I think we need to go beyond that. And again, I'm speaking from ignorance here, but I think I need to hear that there is a dedicated disc where someone is available 24 seven, if I may so, to work with these individuals to help them to write up their projects or their innovations in some marketable form that they can take this, whether to the financial institution, whether to a potential you know, venture capitalist, et cetera. They need help and they need help because again, I say it over and over, most of our innovation is coming from the man in the street. Note Harold and Cliff point out the music, the cuisine, you know, the dance or culture, it's all embedded in the people. And our institutions are failing to bring that to the fore. Only 30% of them, unless they're shy, to bring their, their, their innovations forward. But the point I'm making is we need that kind of support, you know, for our innovators, you know, for them to be able to present their, their, their innovations well, to get access to funding. We need to get valuators who have international credibility you know, so that our funding agencies, 
financial institutions can get that extra, you know, comfort zone of some international endorsement of our valuations. And I need to just lastly say, how can we get our private sector and our academic institutions to participate in submitting their information for them to know it is not threatened in any way. It's simply a matter of collation to bring together the total, you know, picture on the radar of what is happening in Jamaica for us to be able to say, yes, we are truly an innovative nation and moving forward. Because as we are saying, innovation is a hallmark and the, the actual fulcrum for development of any nation, especially a developing one like ours. I think I'll stop there. Thanks very much, Prof. I know you could have done the whole lecture, um, but thanks for sharing all your insights and things um, with us, Prof. Um, but yes, thanks for being also brief. I think that, as I say, we kind of know some of the challenges and we just need to look and coalesce around some of the solutions. So I'm going to open the floor now um, in time that we have remaining. I mean, some persons have been posting questions in the Q&A, so thanks for that. And we've been trying to respond. So our panelists, if you uh, see a question in the Q&A and you can answer, please go ahead. We do ask you, if you do type it to say who you're asking the question to, but maybe in the interest of time, we'll just unmute your mic and pose your question to any of the panelists who you've heard this morning. So the floor is now open, please. Love to hear your comments, your suggestions, your inputs um, into our topic this morning. What's being done currently? What can be done to strengthen our ecosystems in terms of innovation, our GII rankings, and so forth? Um, so I did see earlier that there was a question from Wayne, Wayne Lovell. Ms. Lovell, do you want to go ahead? Not sure Mr. Lovell is there and can unmute. No, okay. Um, all right, I see uh, Miss Webley. Yes, can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you, Joel. Okay, thank you. And thank you very much to all the presenters. Um, on the topic of solutions, I see in the chat and I, I believe it was raised earlier about the role of public-private partnerships to help, as um, Prof. Morrison was saying, move these innovations forward. I know that the methodology or how, how government is able to actually partner with private entities was being resolved. And I'm wondering if that's been worked out and if we can now look forward to seeing some more progress with the actual establishment of these, these bodies as, as ways to move these innovations forward. Because Professor Morrison is right. There are great innovations that have come into Jamaica by Jamaicans that really lack. There's just that gap, and and it's really that entity I believe that's missing. I'm not sure who can answer, but thank you. I don't know. Thanks for that, Joan. I don't know if um, Harold wants to. Yeah. Um. Th thanks for that, Joan. And good to hear you, Joan. I haven't seen you in a while. Good well. um, to hear you. <laughs> uh. Yes. A, a lot of those. Tensions, I believe, have been, I mean, it's still a work in progress, but we have gone a, a, some ways where that is concerned. I mean, we at JBDC, we do have um, incubators um, that actually persons come and actually do their product development and so on right there um, in that space. And we provide, you know, the technology and, and, and the expertise and so on to guide them. And it's, and it's, and it's completely, um, uh, we have a high trust, trust with our um, clients and they know that we are there um, for support. And certainly, Prof, I wanted to show you as well that um, the business development that needs to accompany the innovative idea as well is something at the core of what we are responsible for as well. It needs to, do, to, to be scaled, obviously. I mean, the process of doing that um, by including all of the universities in a network called Small Business Development um, Centers right across the, right across the country. Um, so that's the process of scaling it up, but that's what this is. That's what that is about, really, making sure that we can create a bankable uh, document, a bankable solution um, from uh, from from an innovation um, that may come to the table that a financier will look favorably upon. So yes, some of that work is 
is is is going on and happening. Yeah. So, sorry, so could I, so it's possible if I want to partner with and create an entity with JIPO or with JBDC, that's possible now? Um, when you say an, create an entity with, what you mean exactly? A, 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 as in a public-private partnership, a joint venture, I suppose. is the... Oh, that's what you mean. Um, um, well, the framework that we have now is supporting you to create your own, so providing you with, 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 um uh the necessary technical resources and some in some instances resource tech, uh, financial resources we haven't gotten to the model yet where we um where where we will jointly own the venture not yet not yet okay thank you Can make an intervention marcos i think um there are institutions and it was mentioned in kayla's presentation where she spoke to the work of the development bank of jamaica which has avenues where the public and the private sector can have joint activities and projects. But in terms of, for example, having a partnership specifically with the intellectual property office, that may provide some challenges because we're available to everyone. So we can't have a specific partnership. For example, we work with both the public sector and the private sector in providing relevant information, but in the specific area of having a partnership, that would be a challenge. Right. Okay. Uh, thanks for that, um, Christian Jordan. Thanks for the answers, Harold and Lily Fair. Um, Julia, Julia Dewey from the Bureau of Standards of Jamaica. Uh, her hand is up. Good morning, Julia. Good morning. Um, good morning, all. Very good presentations. I'm quite happy to see this. Um, I, you know, I'm from Bureau of Standards Jamaica, and we have found that standards is a very important part, a, um, component of productivity and um, knowledge, but we don't have data. I think we spoke a lot about collecting data. So we don't have data locally about how standards are being implemented and how it's impacted on innovation, how it's impacted on, impacting on productivity. Um, I do believe it's important. Um, I think Kayla mentioned an agency, ANI in Uruguay, that is responsible for, as a platform for integrating the whole, the six different areas, levels that contribute to innovation. Um, I don't know if I'm missing it, but is there an agency in Jamaica that is trying to pull that together? For example, I know there's a National Competitiveness Council, and in fact, lately they've uh, suggested them that they should track standards to contribute to innovate, innovate, innovation and total, total factor productivity because that is also a big indicator of innovation and, and, and patents and those things and how, how, how we are moving as a country. So the question I have really is what is the plan if there is any, if there is not an agency, if there's an agency, which is it? Because I think I'm looking and trying to figure out which would have been responsible for that. But I think it needs to be more structured, that it, it should not be left to different pieces of the pie. Who's pulling it together? Somebody mentioned having a meeting with Minister Shaw. So, you know, what is the plan? What's the roadmap? And how do we integrate all of this? Because if everyone wants to do that, standards are being addressed and checked. Right. Um, right, Julia. So just to say that, I mean, I think we're, we're having this discussion you know probably now for the first time this week to really focus on you know uh collectively you know across ministries and agencies and departments what we can do to really strengthen the gii and generally the ecosystem you know so i think that we need to have some more discussions um definitely to see what can be done to fill some of these gaps that we've identified already uh and i think that in terms of that kind of organization i think yeah, I think we need to probably see how we could integrate because certainly I think JBDC does a lot of that already, as Harold shared. But perhaps what you're saying is that they, we could refine, as what um, Cliff is saying, how we have a more supportive ecosystem, you know, and that's that's what we really want to discuss moving forward, you know. Right, and really centralizing the information so it, it, it reflects on the global innovation index and then doing business report and the World Bank report. So it's more centralized because it's there in pieces. But as the data is not collected, so how do we better collect? And right. So, sorry, a little clear, go on. No, no, I was just going to say, Lorena made a point in the policy recommendations. And going forward from this, Kayla did indicate that they would be sharing the information with us 
in a week's time. And I think the policy recommendations that were made by Lorena addresses the point and the issue that Julia is making and raising. Because what we need to do is to recognize that yes, the Global Innovation Index is published, but how do we as a country and as a region ensure that we're growing in the Global Innovation Index and that the inputs are reflected in the outputs. Because if the inputs come in and there's no output, then we're gonna be in deep trouble. Um, so I think arising from this, a recommendation could be made, a strong recommendation, not only to our respective ministers, but also at the level of CARICOM and specifically at the level of COTED and the other instruments of CARICOM to show, to tie it right back in to the reason for CARICOM and how we can utilize the Global Innovation Index to assist us in our further development. And I think that's how we need to look at it. So I think we, in the, everyone who is present here in their respective jurisdictions needs to flesh out the discussion more. So Julia, we're gonna be reaching out to you um, to ensure that you're part of the solution because I think that's where we need to go. Yeah. I want to underscore that point. I think it's a very important point that, um, and, and the emphasis on the fact that this is the first time that we're having a such a discussion um, you know, never too late for a show or a rain. <laughs> but we are having the discussion and it's important now, having had the discussion and raised the awareness and raised the interest and, and put it on the table, that we make sure that, that, it, that it goes forward because very, it's very, very, very important. It's so important for the developing economies of the region. So, so important. So I just want to underscore that point, Lynn Claire. And Charles, and we did, as Marcus mentioned, and I think um, Lorena mentioned it, Minister Shaw spoke to it yesterday in his presentation. So I think he is open and willing to support. So we just need to provide him with the information so that an informed decision can be made in terms of how we, how we progress it. I mean, there is a National Commission on Science and Technology. So there are existing bodies and perhaps what we need to do is to utilize one of the existing bodies to have responsibility for this rather than creating a new entity. And I think perhaps we would get more traction as Prof Morrison mentioned and stated in his intervention. Right, and I think also too that as um, Kayla's example shows, it, it, it needs to be an interministerial, you know, or, or cross cutting, you know, so it gets the best of all that we have to offer, you know, in terms of beyond this from many dimensions. Okay, we're gonna wrap up. I have one final question. So Mr. Gentles is the general manager of the Spirits Pool Association. Of course, several of Jamaica's rooms featured prominently on the GII. Uh, so Chris, good morning. Good morning. <clears throat> thank you, Marcos. Um, th I wanna thank JIPO and WIPO and IDB for putting on a very interesting and relevant uh, seminar. Um, I think it has stimulated thinking and it will be stimulating some action in both the private and public space. Um, I just want to speak briefly to the distance between um, an innovation and having, having an innovation that's a ready product and then developing a production system and then readying that business plan for investment. And I think um, Harold, my former classmate from UWE, um, mentioned uh, at uh, the Jamaica uh, the, the um, Jamaica business. I forget the name of the institution though. JBD. But, um, JBDC. The 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 fact the presence of the um, JBDC and the incubation centers. I think um, the incubators are the tools that we would that the average man would use to move the product from from an innovation to a product, to a business plan, and um, then to a venture capitalist. And um, I think we need more incubators and, and um, of course, to spread them out as well, because by, by best knowledge, and I, I'm sure Harold or Olivia can help me with this, uh, by, by best knowledge, here's a JBDC incubator, which is located in Kingston and there is, there is an incub there is um, 
an incubator, there's an institution at the at UTEC as well, which is quite well known and has had significant success. But we do need broader institutional support in the middle of the island and 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 other types of incubators. I think incubators in music and dance and arts, and which would be a different type of incubator from the incubator for you know inventions. And then of course there is working with those innovations in the in the um, research and development space, like in the agricultural sector and in the food sector. So uh, I want to thank all the presenters, but I, I think one of the one of the um, tools that we can use to move the innovations that we have and move them to ready products and move them into businesses that make a difference in our lives is is a tool of the incubator. That, that's my two cents on this. Okay, all right. Thanks very much, um, Chris. Uh, thanks very much for that, and thanks for coming. You know, and sharing your perspectives. I think we all have to work together, as you say, moving forward, private and public. But I'm going to have a few minutes left, so I'm going to thank all of our panelists and go over to our executive director, Mr. Luther Bellamy, who's going to give our final comments uh, as we close out on this webinar this morning. So over to you, Luther. Thanks so much, Marcus. Um, I think we've had such a wealth of sharing of knowledge and information. I'd like to thank Lorena for bringing the Global Innovation Index presenting it in such a way that it was easily digestible and understandable. I mean, thanks so much, Lorena. And um, Kayla, your presentation was on point. Harold, Prof. Morrison, and Cliff, you really tied up the entire discussion. And I think um, I'm going to ask if it's, a, if it's possible for us to have access to the questions that were placed in the chat after so that we can respond to them because there are a number of questions and comments in the chat that we need to respond to and provide the information on. I think this is a good first step. And, I, and I'm hoping that not only in Jamaica, but in the rest of the region, we'll take the necessary steps to act on what we have heard. And to quote, just like Lorena, Minister Shaw, there's the research, there is the action, the communication, and the evaluation. We've gotten a lot of, we have all the research, so we just need to act now. And it is important for us to act because it, the pandemic has really changed the face in every single jurisdiction. The point that Carlos made about climate change is one that is extremely relevant. I mean, there is talk about changing the hurricane season from June to May, which shows you the whole climate change is affecting us in this region and globally. So there are quite a number of issues that were presented this morning and things that we need to look at so that the entire region can move in the Global Innovation Index rankings because we're only as strong as our weakest link. And I think it's important for all of us to work together so that we can all improve in the GII. It might not be in the GII that comes up for 2021, what we can plan for 2022 and going on so that we can all, as a region, continue to grow and to shine. So thank you so much. I'd like to thank Carol from WIPO for all of the sleepless nights I know that took place in this. Um, we really appreciate this. And um, I mean, we thought it wasn't gonna happen and it happened and we're very grateful. So we look forward to the next steps. Carol will be calling on you. Everybody who presented today, is now going to be a, be a part of this informal team to push the GII. So when we write you, make sure you're available. And I'd like to thank everybody again for their participation. Have a great day, everyone. Thank you. All right. Thank you very much, too. Thanks to all our co-hosts, uh, IDB WIPO, for all you from the region, for staying with us, for our panelists, our presenters, um, and for the hardworking teams behind. Please follow us on social media, JIPO Online or at WIPO or at GII 2020. You can also, of course, follow the information at, uh, at the IDB or at Compete Caribbean. Um, and please, of course, do what you can in your own corners to increase innovation from your own uh, perspectives. Thanks very much. And we'll see you in future discussions on this important topic. Thanks all. Have a good day.